Hello. Welcome to this online conversation called Working the Earth. Working the Earth is taking place in Fabrica, uh, spacious and a little bit empty gallery at the moment. And it's the context and the frame for Semiconductor's Earthworks, which is a five screen. We're in front of two of the five screens, a five screen immersive installation, which shows a different way of looking at the Earth. So using analog modelling, it shows uh, a, both a soundscape and a landscape, in a way, of the Earth's formation. So it's the context and the setting for our discussion, which is focusing on the concept of the Anthropocene and critical uh, ways of challenging the Anthropocene, thinking about the Anthropocene and also challenging it from feminist perspectives, but also from decolonial perspectives. And in particular, from communities that are directly affected by extraction, by mining, mining the earth, substances drawing out what could be called and might be called uh, deep time, so the materials of deep time of the world. Um, and I've got uh, to introduce uh, the people involved in the conversation, and one of those is Lenny Albiera Rojas. I hope I've said your name right. I've been practicing it and probably done it wrong at this moment. And Lenny is from Bolivia, and she's here with us from Zoom. Uh, Lenny is studying critical approaches to development, but importantly, she's here representing an activist group called Terra Husta. So welcome, Lenny. And Alice Owen, welcome too. Alice is studying a PhD at the University of Brighton, and she is in, I'm going to read the name of the centre, it's a really important centre for us at the University of Brighton, it's the Centre for Spatial and Environmental and Cultural Politics. And she too is working with communities uh, affected by fracking in Surrey, so not that far from Sussex. I should say a little bit about myself as well, I'm also based at the University of Brighton. Uh, we're close to Fabrica, so we're being properly local in a very global world. Um, and I'm involved in a collective project called Traces of Nitrate that, like Lenny's work, is uh, based in part in, for us, we're based in Chile, so we're based in, in Latin America, and our work is documenting um, the unequal relationships of mining in Chile. And I should say as well that I work with two people who are not here, Ignacio Acosta and Javier Rivas, so I'm part of a collective that looks at artworks and has been forced to, through that work, think about our relationships with the earth and with communities who are indirectly and directly affected by extraction, so by mining operations in particular, but forms of extracting the earth's materials for human purposes. So I hope those introductions will provide a good context for us, and I'm going to just talk a little bit, a little bit of an introduction about the Anthropocene. So it's a term that some people know and some people have started to use and it's, it's becoming involved in, it coming part of our vocabulary. But it's about 20 years old, so it was first used by a Dutch earth scientist um, in a uh, edition of Nature in, in 2002. There have been several kind of uh, problems with the term and perhaps I could uh, ask both Lenny and Alice to comment on that, is whether the term Anthropocene is useful to them in their thinking or in their activism. So would, I don't know, maybe Lenny, you'd like to go first. Would that be OK? Hi, everybody. Hello. So thanks for the space and the presentation. Well, this, this concept was popularized by Paul Crutzen. He defines it as a new geological epoch characterized by enormous impact of humanity on nature that uh, would have started with industrialization. Um, so some of the critiques that I would make is, um, first of all, only attributing the cause of the social and environmental crisis to the uh, esteem and gene conceals that re the real causes, I think, that are closely linked to historical and political process. So for me, the problem with this interpretation is that humanity is not something abstract. For me, it's not something in homogeneous. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's worth asking if it's the case that all human beings are equally responsible for social and environmental crisis. For example, 
it's like Crutzen puts in the same bag a street market vendor, a woman, and and in the same level of responsibility as a corporation, for example. So um, I think that's very important to 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 notice, and also this com concept reinforces an idea that ignores the historical causes of social injustices. For me, these historical causes are very essential from anti-racist, the colonial feminist perspective. Why? Because the oppression of, of women, for example, is not universal. So it's not something abstract. There are differences not only among uh, men, but also between uh, women based on class privileges, uh, skin color, ethnicity, and sexual choices. Um, so um, something that I want to point that's very important is that within hegemonic feminisms, other forms of oppression between women are, are hidden under the presumption that we are, uh, that there is a, is a sisterhood just because um, we are women and and as if there is equality in the oppression of women, which is not real. So one of my, uh, when, uh, one of the women that I admire, which is Yuderkis Espinosa, a militant, the colonial feminist from Domin Dominican Republic, uh, points out that continuing with this perspective, which puts a, uh, humans and women in a very abstracted way has terrible political consequences for many of us insofar as it continues to conceal that the oppression we suffer is not uh, of a specific type because we are women uh, but because we are racialized women in a time of coloni coloniality so i would say that anthropocene puts its humans in a abstract way, um, hegemonic feminism and gender approaches uh, put women and gender in a, an abstract way too. So this is one of the contribution of the colonial feminisms. So um, I would mention those critiques that I will, I, ca I can uh, mention others in, in the rest of the panel, thanks. And Alice, how about you? So the term Anthropocene, much challenged, as Lenny was talking about. Yes, exactly. And as she was saying, there's been this real tendency for Anthropocene to be this kind of universalizing force, both for the way that we think about our situation on, on the planet Earth at, at the moment as a, as a shared experience, and also in its opposition to, and to some extent. As we heard, there's this tendency for feminism is also to be thought as mm. universal and universalizing, but that's not necessarily mm. um, the case. There are lots of different um, lived experiences during this time or space that we could call mm. the, the Anthropocene. I think something that's really interesting is all these kind of critiques that have accumulated oh. within the Anthropocene uh, discussions and discourses. From one end, you've got this kind of group of, I presume, mostly white, learned, middle-aged men who are this official Anthropocene working group who are there determining, okay, so if we look at the geological strata, the Anthropocene officially starts uh, in the mid-20th century, and then, then you've got these really fascinating critiques that are saying, no, okay, it's not, it's not about what's in the geological strata, it's about the practices and relations behind that. It could be the capitalist scene, and that situates this current moment more in the histories of uh, the Industrial Revolution, followed by the Great Acceleration, all these really insightful decolonial and feminist critiques mm -hmm. that look further back to uh, kind of 1492 and these moments of mm -hmm. colonization where we really see different kind of relationships and forces and logics taking place which are bound up with so many of the, the ways of thinking that we mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. have today, this kind of idea of a, a terra nullis and what's what isn't what's other to to yourself or to your way of living so nature other cultures are all available for for extraction for simplification for domination and for the accumulation of capital and wealth and power and all, all of these things so i think although the anthropocene in itself um 
can be very problematic to use without question. I think it's been a really interesting tool, at least for me, who's come along in like the last couple of years to think mm -hmm. about um, this term that has been so beautifully kind of unpacked and critiqued and, mm -hmm. and troubled in ways that are really useful for mm -hmm. thinking differently about, about what's going on and to try to challenge ourselves to think both at the planetary level and the personal level mm -hmm. to connect what's, what's going on around the world everywhere with the different ways that that becomes manifest according mm -hmm. to um, our experiences, our places, how we're exposed to these different mm -hmm. systems, especially of um, extractivism, which I think the extractor scene is, could be a really interesting alternative yeah. to the Anthropocene yeah. to explore. So, and so extractor scene, so we are we, some, almost as soon as the word Anthropocene has come into our vocabulary, it's, it's been challenged. Um, very importantly, and by this renaming process. And there is a, a curator and writer, uh, art critic TJ Demos, and his term actually is racial capitalocene, is his renaming of the Anthropocene. And that's quite interesting. Maybe we can talk more about that. But there's a few things I wanted to say in response to, to both Lenny, your contribution, and yours, Alice, already, which is one of them is around humanity as an abstraction and the problem about that. Because in, in a way, the Anthropocene is exactly that. It's a, it's, take, it's, it's a scientist looking out over the earth and then uh, giving, literally stratifying it according to age. And so there's an assumption there of a Western notion of progress that time is going to be moving forward and going to be moving forward forever. And the Anthropocene is a little bit of a problem because we've created a wasteland of our earth and we're looking at a sort of climate disaster, an ecological disaster and, and uh, unequal distribution of wealth within those disasters. But there is this still sense of time moving forward, of the abstraction of time. So in some ways, the Anthropocene sort of helps us look at the world differently, acknowledging human domination, but also puts us right back where we were before with, with human solutions, human in the abstract solutions to human problems. So there's that, that concept of, of the problem of abstraction is really, really helpful, I think, for us trying to think about new ways of looking at the world, really, really helpful. I mean, and the other, the other issue I think that we've raised already is, is to do with ways of knowing. So what are the ways we could know the world You've said Anthropocene is useful, a useful tool, but what other ways can we get to know the meaning of the Earth, the problem of extraction? Because at least the Anthropocene talks about a human-to-Earth relationship that has been ignored for so many years. At least it begins to do that. I don't know who wants to try and go with that rather huge question first. I don't know. Lenny, would you have a go? Instead of Anthropocene, <laughs> for me... Uh, uh, it would be like capitalism, like uh, Jameson Moores, who's an American historian, point of, uh, and I, I agree with that because that has to do a lot with colonization, with how women's life changed and with extractivism. It's just part of that. It's not, I think the, the category of extractivism done let us understand in a um, deep way how uh, what's happening uh, from the root. So what I I agree with this uh, with Moore's uh, when he points, for example, that uh, the cause of the ecological crisis is linked to the dynamics of the capital. He states that. That's why he, he, he mentioned that rather than, uh, uh, we are rather living in the capitalism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in Latin America, um, um, some of most critical pers perspectives from, not just from the colonial feminism, but also this very critical Marxist tradition um, has, a lot to, has a lot to say about this uh, proposed. Mm -hmm. So that's why for me it was important to understand how Anthropocene has to do or not, for example, with the process that we 
uh, lived historically in Latin America and, and also with women, women's oppression. And it's, it's, it is not related. Uh, that's one of the other critiques no, of the dominant interpretation of Anthropocene has, does not conceive the cause the causes of the planetary crisis. And that's why this concept ignores the historical power relations con that was configured from colonization, conquest and patri patriarchy. So, um, and if, if, if maybe it's mentioned in some way, I think it's, it's just as, as an appendix. So it's, it's not at a central uh, place. So for example, um, uh, for me, uh, one of the events that drastically changed the relationship between human beings and nature was the emerge of capitalism. But it's very important to see uh, how that also changed um, women's bodies that has a lot to do with that. So in Latin America, which was before called Abia Yala, uh, was the first colony of Europe, of the modern Europe. But today it's still part of, of I don't know if it's, uh, if you will understand, but we're still part of this periphery, uh, like marginalized and Europe still being the center. So capitalism from its inception would, would not have developed without capitalism colonization in Latin America, uh, the expropriation of peasants, peasant lands in Europe, slavery in Africa, and and witch hunts. I'm not if I'm pronouncing very well that word um, that happened in this uh, 50s, 60s and 17th centuries in Europe and in Latin America. So it's really interesting the way that you've amplified on the, on the problem of the Anthropocene as abstracting humanity, particularly in the ways in which the processes of history have shaped and reshaped bodies, physical bodies, as well as political processes. So it's really, uh, really important. Thank you. And Alice, would you like to say some more? I started the question was about other ways of trying to think the relationship between humans and the Earth. Sure. So I think I'll answer that in relation to the Anthropocene, um, but in relation to this idea of um, responsibility as in who's responsible mm -hmm. and then responsibility. Um, Donna Haraway talks about this with her ideas of the um, Cthulhu scene, all this kind of tentacular connectedness that has come from this really interconnected political economic system that we're in as kind of two ways of thinking about how to answer that question mm -hmm. with the Anthropocene. And I think this is maybe really well illustrated in the semiconductor piece Earthworks. So that idea of responsibility comes up. So there's the, the several stages they show in the piece, right, of all the kind of really fluid um, natural geological processes and then this final... Um, experience of um, quarrying and it's really chaotic and um, um, kind of compared to the, the, the other beautiful scenes mm -hmm. it's really rapid and there's a, there's a lot going on and it's quite overwhelming to see that, that and kind of put it as they do in mm -hmm. the space of 12 minutes or however long it is into a, a more human way of um, experiencing mm -hmm. that so I think just within the way that they've done that, you have a sense of being able to identify responsibility. So you could say in this instance, okay, it's whoever's doing the quarrying at that quarry who's responsible for that particular um, disruption in the, the natural geological flows. And mm. by being able to, to perceive it on a more human level, you're able to um, cultivate your own response. Mm. Um, so I think that's part of the way of... Um, finding different ways to, to connect with the earth. And that's something I've been thinking about a lot. So that one of the sites that I've been doing my research at and researching with the um, campaigners there, um, it's called Horse Hill. It's in Surrey. It's this really um, uninteresting, mundane, very small little pad where they've got 
at the moment just a, a trail and they're, they're doing a process which may or may not be similar to fracking because we don't really know what's going on because there's a lack of information. But anyway, um, myself and um, a ceramicist, Santhi Mags, um, were kind of thinking about, okay, so what else could we do with um, this land that isn't extractivism, that's kind of the opposite? How could you cultivate a different kind of sense of community or different kind of relation with the land to extractivism, what would that look like? So her being a ceramicist, she knows um, a different way of knowing the earth, which is how to forage clay. Um, so we did some of that and we did a little community workshop working with the local campaigners and we were just thinking through these questions. Okay, so rather than drilling through the literal Anthropocene, that literal layer of earth, which has the kind of stratigraphic markers of um, a radioactive fallout or whatever it is, um, what else can we do with that? So I think it's these kind of small ways and individual level of cultivating new kind of ways of connecting with, um, with the natural world in the slow. And I think this is something that's very interesting to do somewhere like Surrey, where there isn't a sense of folklore or the, the loss of ways of connecting with the earth is so far back in human history that it's a new opportunity in a way yeah. no it's really interesting and, and sorry Lenny by the way it's usually known as its commuters will so they're people who would be working in the city of London and other places mm -hmm. within the structure of capitalism that you talked about in the heart not the periphery but the very heart so I wondered if I could ask you a little bit to talk about your work um, in terms of Terra Husto and your work with uh, around issues of extractivism and mining in Bolivia and maybe we can draw these disparate cases together and see where we get to. Terra Justa accompanies and support organizations and communities fighting for social, economic and, and environmental justice, uh, uh, especially those affected by extractive projects in Latin America and um, yeah, in this case, uh, one of the communities that we support in, in the south of Peru, which mainly there are mining uh, projects. Um, one of these communities is Espinar. <clears throat> uh, the company that is working in this <clears throat> community is Glencore. <clears throat> so Glencore, maybe you heard about this company. Um, it's a Swiss mining company, but it's listed on the London Stock Exchange. So in a recent article, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry, that was published by, uh, mm, that was uh, written by my colleague Aldo Rellana, uh, uh, points uh, very important aspects on how mining companies are still reproducing these colonial power relationships <clears throat> in their uh, dealing with the communities uh, where this uh, uh, company operates. Um, the, the name of the project is Antapakai. Usually they used to put a name that has to do with the native language we, and, and so on, right? Jose Antonio Romero, who is a sociologist, a member of local organization, is an expert of mining conflicts also, um, that that is a, one of our allies, uh, explains very, very well the context of the place. And for example, in this place, um, like this 60 or 70 percentage, um, uh, it's uh, in this place is, is concentrated the 60 and 70 percentage of copper production in Peru. So um, they, it's, it's like in the place where most mining companies are operating there. So, and uh, what I could mention, one of the of the big, uh, or one of the most um, visible things that happens uh, always <laughs> since the colonization is the thing that with extractivism, uh, we, uh, well, the, the, I would say that the new times of colonization, the companies always say that with these mining projects, people will be, uh, the, the, the city, the, the community will develop because they will uh, offer um, jobs and, and many other projects and so on and so on. So, but despite the amount of production and income that's 
that generates this this company. Uh, for example, this this sociologist Romero indicates that Espinar, for example, this case is um, widespread poverty. The the in 38 years of mining and the 70 percentage of the population lives in poverty or or extreme poverty and also according <clears throat> to other information it's like, just to in, understand how how they still taking um most of the benefits like in the colonization time for example from every ten dollars that is produced by Peru, Peru's mining uh, sector, uh, it states just one one dollar in the country. So we still like in the same time as well, the same or worse, I would say. <laughs> so this shows that the, that the deep down uh, that the deep down there is a very strong level of appropriation and accumulation due to due to part of the transnational sector, mainly mining. So, and, and just not the only thing, po pollution. Uh, there are studies that certain uh, institutions says that, for example, the, the rivers, they have, they had two rivers that, uh, in, that were impacted by mining operations. And now they, there are, those are dead rivers. So diversity in the fish po fish population no, no longer exists. So according to him also, um, um, is that, for example, many people, uh, something very visible in the communities that uh, also it's death and malformation of animals. Um, they have less level level of production productivity because most of them used to live from agriculture um, and all of them is due to mining activity so people have a lot of uh, toxic metals in general and and the company and also the state said that oh that's a problem because indigenous people or peasants uh don't know how to live or whatever they they never um do something about that so those uh, um, to this impact we must add uh, the increased cost of living the places where these companies arrive to to extract ma minerals for example for example uh, the the cost of life increase so living in a mining district is more expensive. Food, uh, logging, when we were there, yeah, we could see that it's like the same people of the, this, the community to have access for some products that um, the before were, was cheaper, now they have to pay more. So supposedly they should develop, but that means that they, they have many problems and this, the the cost of living it's 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 more expensive so uh, those those impacts in the case of espinar go uh, hand in hand with uh, the composition of this social fabric um so about that like this community we have many examples in latin america but um uh, in the south of peru I think it's where they ha they have like the, the highest number of social conflicts. Mm -hmm. So home conflicts also is uh, uh, are something that's all the time in their daily lives. So th it's um, after all I mentioned, uh, the organizations are uh, criminalized, um, are fragmented. Um, so they got divided that's the strategy of the company um the company is free to operate without major demands placed upon it so um it, as you can see it, the communities never develop never um it, never increase the, this the, the their their lives like like the discourse that 
well, the company and the state have a big dis discourse about that, but in the practice, that's, that's not happening. So, for example, uh, there was a conflict in 2012, uh, one of the big conf conflicts, because many conflicts uh, passed. And in this case, uh, the conflict left three people dead and, criminal and many criminalized leaders among them um, Oscar Moyewanka who was a former major of this community and and also um, many other actors are it's like they become weaker and 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 the company continues uh, making other projects although they are many conflicts although they didn't resolve those conflicts so um, Another thing that I would mention to finish is that many women in Espinar have experienced other forms of aggression, such as sexual ab abuse, uh, which is not the same for the other members of the community. They are not exposed to the same types of, of violence. And, and, and it's something that happens from the colonization. We are the result of that. Um, looking at this panorama, we can say that currently the degradation of women together with the continuous ex expulsion of peasants and indigenous people from the land, it's uh, in, in other places uh, in the world war, they are, we still having war. Um, and I think all those antecedents could help us to understand that we continue living the same um, time, like in the colonization, colonization time, uh, because um, for the capitalism to emerge, for the capital, capitalism, it was uh, uh, a requirement. It was a condition. So those things are still happening because capitalism needs to. To be, to be reproduced. So in that way, uh, we, st we still live in that way of, of oppression. And there's so many things to reflect on. And one of them I think is important to think about is, is, is acts of violence and acts of violence that are associated with mining. So it raises the question of who has the right to mine and almost always mining, whether it's in Horse Hill or it's in South Peru, there's, is done by a huge company. So the, the right to mine is not, is not given or permitted by local communities. It's often against the wishes of those local communities. And it's that right to mine. It's something that you said earlier, Alice, about, about, um, about understanding nature just to be at human disposal. And if we put that together with things that Lenny has said about human disposal is not an abstract, but human disposal is presupposes these unequal relations. I don't suppose you know who's fracking who's fracking in Surrey at the moment or the name of the company. But I think there are some things around the viol violence upon communities, upon women in particular, violence upon the earth, and that notion of who has the right, which is quite interesting. So I don't know whether you know in Horse Hill who's, who's fracking. Yeah, I can definitely respond to that. Um, so it's interesting that you said it's big companies, but actually what's happening in Surrey is it's not a big company. Oh, it's right. a really small company who are really failing, um, which is great news. Um, they're called UK Oil and Gas, UCOG, um, and they literally popped up with the hope that they would find all these shale resources across the Weald, across the south of England mm -hmm. and the Isle of Wight, um, kind of following what was going on in the north of, the, of England in Lancashire with Quadrilla and the um, fracking that got a bit further in their, in their stages before the fracking moratorium. Um, so it's a really small company who are just... So obviously, so obviously that even the shareholders now have lost trust mm. in the CEOs and the, the two or three people who have made a lot of money just by having this company, which is almost a, a shell of a company. It's an, it's an idea. It's an idea that we can extract oil from the British countryside for British people. So it's tied up with a lot of other ideas at the moment of nationalism and um, holding on, I think, to the fossil capitalism mm. economy um, in the face of reality and the science that's increasingly apparent that we cannot continue um, in that way. Can you say just a little bit about what fracking is? Because if we were talking about extractivism as an act of violence upon the earth, 
that then produces other forms of violence against communities in its differing effect across the globe. Some many communities are more protected than others. Mm -hmm. I think the people of Surrey are definitely more protected than the people of South Peru. But what does it actually do? I understand it as being deep, deep mining, so beyond a particular level in the stratis stratification of the earth. Mm -hmm. Is that so, right? Um, fracking, as it suggests, is about fracturing. Um, and there are actually, it's, it's not easy to give a clear definition because there are many. So the UK mm -hmm. changed its definition of fracking in 2015. So for us, it's about, has to be a certain volume mm -hmm. of um, uh, liquid at a certain pressure over a certain period of time. And anything less than that doesn't count as fracking, mm -hmm. even though it would in the US, for instance, or in Australia, they've got different definitions. So actually we should perhaps shouldn't talk about what's happening in Surrey as fracking because it doesn't fall under that same definition. So fracking is used for um, tight uh, geological formations. Um, so usually you have like a, the best way I've heard it described is so normal extraction is like a, a jam donut and you can just go in and extract the jam. But fracking is more like a tiramisu. You're trying to extract the liquid from uh, a really tight formation. Mm -hmm. So you need high pressure and... Um, or acid to dissolve the rock. So it's this extra level of um, fracture and destruction and um, this rises to the surface as well. We've seen um, the fractures, it's exposed in democracy. So um, in Lancashire, the local council said no to fracking and that was overruled by the national government. And I think for a lot of people that was uh, an opportunity to, to realise that, okay, they've been lied to once, what else have they not? understood the truth about and I think it goes from from fracking and maybe waking up in the night and feeling an, an earthquake and the mm. subsurface is literally waking you up to these more metaphorical seismic shifts in in understanding you, you see people who've started as not activists at all to now really concerned about not only what like their local environments but to um, climate change and it's also a really interesting way of not necessarily comparing to the kind of experiences that are happening as Lenny was, ex mm -hmm. uh, Lenny was explaining, but of finding a, a connection, so a space of new solidarities, at least that's my hope. And you described earlier in the piece Earthworks is the, what uh, one of the makers, so Joe Geha, described as the sound of the Anthropocene, which was the jolting, jarring, and he said mechanical noises towards the end, mm. which we could interpret, and they're using uh, scientific data, but then in an art gallery, we can then interpret as a particular kind of violence upon the earth. Um, and when mining in Latin America, Lenny, I am, you will, could correct me if I'm wrong, but often it's really large, large open cast mining. So they are huge, violent, not incisions, but, but massive scars on the earth that are water polluters. And so I wondered as well about questions about pollution from fracking and where that goes, but the dry riverbeds, water that's so polluted that it can never be used again, so water no longer is a renewable resource, it becomes a finite resource when once mining's involved. So I wondered if you, if you could describe for us a little bit of this, either if from any of the case studies that Tara Huster works on, is what, what does the land look like when extractivism takes place and how does it change the uh, balance, and you talked a little bit about the balance of um, human to husbandry to looking after animals and so on. So I wondered if you could, for people who may not know or have ever seen those scenes, give us a description. Yeah, it's um, difficult to explain something. Um, it will be very different if you can be in the place uh, after the mining mm -hmm. uh, corporation operates there and, and, and before. So um, what we could see being in those communities, um, well, most of them all the time says that they can, um, as I mentioned, most of the rivers are death. Mm -hmm. two, two main rivers in this community are death. So you could imagine like the water was different, it, the, the color of, of the water, the smell turns different it's 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 like a place where you can feel uh, easily that something it's it's not uh, good and yeah that 
this this idea of that rivers uh, it's 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 very strong for me because for them for example yeah that used to uh, eat many types of fishes in that place can't or when, when we were arriving there for example they used to say yeah those fishes that you are eating well the the other ones in the other rivers that they are contaminated but not that totally they they have uh, toxic toxic minerals and and you eat it, it also happens in the in the uh, border between Bolivia and Peru because of this the process of, of these big minings and 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 this is not just the the impact in some some mining companies and not just mining companies but also for example oil uh, the uh, for example sometimes happen that they um i derrames how can i say derrames it's when you when they have a, a technical problem and and the oil spread in the river it's an like an accident mm -hmm. so it's terrible you see black rivers and 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 it's incredible how the companies could uh, invent so it's 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 something for me that that uh, helped me to understand that people is still seeing indigenous as a inferior people that don't understand that don't realize many things for example once i remember in bolivia sorry i'm, I'm mixing another experience in bolivia where we did many many years before as a ter with, with, with the process of Terra Justa, where, for example, the company was inventing things. And when the people in the community asked why our rivers are black, why our animals have uh, malformations, um, why this smells in, like this, it, it, that didn't happen before. So they answered that was something that will help them to productivity in their lands also you can imagine uh, the things that i would say they 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 say they answer to the community although you are seeing smelling and and looking at the big impacts and the worst thing is in people people is it's in in our meetings that we had in peru the ones the, the, the women that there were two women that came from the community one of them has problems it's like uh, they they are not um how can i explain it's they they have i think the impact on the health because you have many metals toxic metals in your blood is not enough investigated so they are surviving with those impacts so for example she used to be tired all the time um not feeling well to speak uh, things that they can't explain and and the doctors in the community that are uh say that oh no that's that's something that has to do with the, the type of life you have that that thing has to do with the mining operations there so yeah it was very strong for us to see uh all those things but also in uh, the, uh, the, the impacts in the bodies of, of the people who's living in those places. Uh, yeah. So all the things that you're eating is, is it's made with water that is not um, um, qualified for humans, but the, the people who works in the mining, they buy their water from other places, but the community have to consume that food, that water, Every day, there's no other option. The way you're talking about the effects of copper mining now, in contemporary mines now, it makes it reminds me of those questions about how we need to rethink time, not time as progress, but a different kind of time, where time doesn't necessarily move in these linear directions, but actually these, uh, pro well, I don't know, problems, but effects of history keep recurring in different kinds of spaces. And so I'm, I wonder whether or not that's also to do with new forms of knowledge. So when we, if we go back to where we were at the beginning, we were thinking about how can we know the Earth differently. 
So we can hear stories and we often hear stories of the problems of mining, but how can we see those so that we begin to not just record those problems, but actually begin to think differently and not make those, not keep on in that kind of cycle of capitalism reproducing itself. So I don't know if you want to have, say something, uh, Alice, about your work, about trying, about thinking about knowledge and different forms of knowledge of mm. the earth. Yeah, absolutely, because on, on the one hand with, with fracking, the whole reason that it's allowed to happen is because um, you've got um, the geology, right? And you've got people doing the, the resource speculation and even though that sounds very neutral and um, scientific and they're just, you know, doing the explorations and making estimates and doing all sorts of calculations, of course, that's not at all neutral. Why would you be counting your resources unless you wanted mm. to um, extract them? So you've got this whole scientific underpinning that seems to be um, neutral but is in fact really economically motivated mm. um, and it's so apparent if you look at our planning systems um, which are completely hypocritical to the kind of um, greenwashing climate agendas that the government are pushing through there's still a priority for exploiting resources so you've got these kind of um, neutral sciences and I don't know you can call it economics a pseudoscience of some sort mm -hmm. they're kind of working together on on the one hand and then what I found really beautiful um so they're no longer fracking in Lancashire because that's the kind of fracking that does fall under the the definition and there's a moratorium um in no small part due to the um, amazing mobilizations that were happening there for nearly a decade I think um and something that I found fascinating was the kind of new kind of knowledges and also old knowledges that were being brought up there so there was um we we're talking about water a short time ago and some of the protests were happening at the same time as the dakota access pipeline where this water is life narrative became really strong and there was a lot of ideas of solidarity and people were learning from these other other ways of knowing about the the earth mm. um indigenous knowledges i think although of course we shouldn't extract from them i think can really help people to understand mm. that are just to even think that there can be another way of knowing mm -hmm. about the earth can be really instructive. And women's knowledges as well. Um, a lot of the kind of health impacts and implications and risks, especially, we've heard about from fracking in, in America and elsewhere and other kinds of mining and water pollution. Um, the burden of care for the families often falls upon upon the women because the environment and health are so closely interconnected. So something that was really interesting that happened in Lancashire was this group um, called the, the Knitting Nanas and they were inspired by a similar group in Australia who were, who were knitting grandmas against fracking. And they kind of, I think they were just so fed up of the lack of um, agency that all this amazing research they'd done collecting the stories of um, real impacts elsewhere and campaigning there, put their MPs to, to say no, all of that was completely futile in the end. So what they ended up doing was every Wednesday they do, it's called the Women's Call for Calm, and they would all dress in white and stand at the gates of the fracking site and just observe 15 minutes silence and then just to kind of bring a pause to a lot of the... Um, that's, it's not at all on the, scale, the same level as we're hearing, but kind of police repression and... Um, small acts of violence happening in this way and people getting really quite traumatised by being involved in the protests and seeing this fracking rig appearing day by day and understanding the consequences that that would have. So they just did this call for calm and then this really joyful kind of cake at the gate and singing and dancing in the street and cultivating community. So these kind of not only knowledges but kind of practices that come from um, experiences and then in a kind of similar vein at Horse Hill for the last year, there's been um, once a month a kind of gathering or ritual called Faith at the Gate. So that's for all faiths and none. And that's just a time to kind of make a, make a space for um, problematizing what's going on at Horse Hill, but also to kind of point out the other ways of um, understanding what's going on there. It's something that is destructive and violent and um, often those... Um, events have been very responsive to what's going on at the time of year and the seasons and in touch with nature and just observing, yeah. um, bearing witness to and what's going on. It's something that under COVID people have been quite conscious of, okay. 
is to is there's a slower time mm. that that can be observed if people are not in the in the very very rapid routines of the repeating cycles of capitalism a slightly slower time and the ceramics project that used the earth in a particular way that you talked about at horse hill do you, did that have a, did that bring a different kind of knowledge in the same way that the protesters brought a different kind of knowledge so did that project that was research or art project offer another form of knowledge in some ways, we kind of used, um, we only managed to have one workshop before lockdown and all of that, but we kind of used that as a space um, for the activists and uh, ourselves and the mm -hmm. community campaigners to just have some time where they weren't in a planning meeting and having to think about the next court hearing or court process that they were organising or the fundraising that they were doing for that or writing the submissions to the planning um, council because I think that's what a lot of activist time is taken up with. So it was also a space just to share mm -hmm. stories of why are you here? Why do you care? Okay, what should we make that means something to us and um, forges a per little personal connection and a shared experience? We were just talking about the ways in which different practices in and around the mining sites can bring new forms of knowledge to uh, both to politics, people making decisions about the rights to mine, but also maybe to wider understandings of our relationship between humans and humans not as an abstract category but as particular people often divided by uh, wealth and geography and colonialism um, so i was thinking about how part of the earthworks installation which is just 12 minutes wrong you're absolutely right it is just 12 minutes provides a different way of thinking about the earth the earth does have a sound I know that the, the maker's semiconductor talked about how they haven't made it song-like, but it seems to have life. And I know that many of you were talking about the life of the rivers and the life of communities that are, that are disrupted by mining. But I wondered whether or not you could speak to any of the different understandings of the relationship between communities that live near mines and the earth itself, and the extent to which when a mining company comes in like Glencore that trades in a Swiss company based in London, geographically distant, have a different concept of intervening in the land, extracting from the land than the people that live in and around those spaces. For me, one of the things that uh, it's mm, like more visible um, and that also has to do with the alternatives to these um, planetary crisis is, for example, the, the conception of um, nature, the uh, dominant conception of nature has, has in, uh, influenced in the solutions that, that many scientists uh, um, gave us. And for example, the company used to say that with the technology, they would uh, not have big impacts in the community, but they don't uh, they don't um, make the basic things to to have the like the minimum requirements taking care of the environment. The state is not um, behind them, looking for or trying to see that that they are doing what they said in the theory. So. That's why the, the impacts are bigger. Mm -hmm. So, and for me, that has to do with, with this conception of nature where the resources are illimited and they could do whatever. And supposedly with that, with, uh, with, this, uh, with technical and, um, and, and very, um, technique solutions, they will resolve any problem. But what's happening in the practice is that what they extract, uh, it's, uh, so it's like the logic of the capitalism. So it's, it's mm, the capitalism needs all the time and ev every time more fast and more fast uh, exploit, ex extract, uh, uh, but in, in with the purpose of, of uh, 
having more um, um, economic benefits. Mm -hmm. So la, la ganancia, like uh, something that's very important for them is to be that, that that thing has to be very lucrative. So that's the main goal. And so it doesn't matter what happened then with the nature. So in that in that in this in in this case, I think the 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 frequency of 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 how capitalism is going to expropriate lands, extract, and think it's it's more fast, and than than the time that nature needs to recover. So. It's it's a lie what I say that they could with with technology could resolve the impacts, because in the practice it's not happened that uh, at the uh, in the frequency that they are going, but the communities have a different conception of nature, but there's a risk on that because yeah one well the big difference is that for the communities the nature, it's everything, it's everything and and the main goal. Uh, well, the, the the purpose with the nature is it's because it's everything, um, uh, and it's very important. It's it's because uh, they, they they think that based on that idea is is, is that uh, they think that the the, the nature um, will satisfy all their necessities. So that's why there are many rituals. Well, in different communities, there are many different ways. It's not the same way, but the main idea is that, that the nature, um, it's uh, it's something alive, uh, and and that's the the main thing. Uh, life, it's the center, the most uh, important thing uh, that supports this idea of the nature. But in the capitalism. Um, is it's in that they, they they are interested in the nature in order to exploit it as much as they can one of the uh, overarching problems is that position of observing nature from which you can extract something something a mineral a special substance that is needed for commodities and it, then it tears asunder the set of balances that can produce life and it's as if you, which is really interesting what you're saying about how the speed of capitalism is not the speed of the renewal of those resources. Millions of years, you're talking about fracking and copper. And so that is an interesting thing, and it's right to call it a lie, because there's a real deception around the timescales of extractivism and of capitalism, the timescales of which those resources are being plundered and used. And that collision of time is really interesting. So sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I should, I should let you finish. For me, it's... Um... It's like you are saying, the conception of nature in capitalism is like something finite, mm -hmm. finite. And cycles of appropriation of nature are faster than the cycles of generation, as you mentioned. So there can be no alternatives on their conception of nature, on their disconception of nature in the capitalism framework. I would like to read uh, just a paragraph about that, that it says that, for example, mm, the dominant conceptions of nature has influenced the solutions proposed by scientists who focus on the technical and the scientific. Uh, for example, geology, biology, and in general, the modern understanding of science has been at the service of domination of natural and the advent of capitalism. So we have to be, cons be conscious about that because Sometimes we think that, that just the bio, um, the biologists or geologists know better how nature, uh, it's uh, what happened with the nature. But no, I think uh, it's a political and historical issue and, and communities, the knowledge of the communities that hopefully, although the colonizations and all the type of violence that that happened here is some of them still alive. And I think we can we can talk about talking about alternatives. But the only thing, sorry to 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 explain more, that the, the other thing that I want to mention is that there's another risk 
So what I said is very important for me, but there's, there's a risk when we then try to idealize uh, the, the role of the indigenous. It's like we, we want to, there's a tendency of romanticized natives and in, in a very essentialist way. So including by, for example, attributing them a care of nature as something innate. Um, so the idea of conservation is, is linked, for example, to the return of the good savage. Um, uh, it is like the, the indigenous as one, like they, they see the indigenous of, of, one, of one more component of the biodiversity. So that's for me very, uh, it has a colonial origin and, and, and remains to this day. So this romanticized conservation discourse is expanding more and more and which is having um, the, um, for example, what happened with this type of conceptions is that um, the, the solutions for the, the communities could be affected. For example, indigenous people could have, be, have, uh, have the right to have the territories, um, but, but, um, but not just, just because they are good uh, native, natives or, or good indigenous people uh, taking care of the nature. It's like, for example, imagine that someone that lives in the city uh, does not comply with current understandings of sustainable living practices, then uh, their home will be expropriated. So that could happen if, if, uh, if that's the, if, if there's a politic that accept them just in this case. So I think something similar happens with women too, but, um, but beyond the romanticization of the indigenous, of course, uh, it's important to recognize that the majority of indigenous communities, despite the forms, as I mentioned, of domination since colonization, uh, in many cases, um, they have managed at different ways of relationship between nature uh, and human beings and that could help us to see alternatives uh, in front of the capitalism. Yeah, most, uh, it's, it's, um, it's difficult to talk about now uh, examples about that, but uh, I would mention that. Thanks. And the question about time and different understandings of time so you have your, the protesters in Lancashire who are asking for a pause. And so I wondered if that, in your work, or in Horse Hill, there's a different notion of time scales, the speed at which uh, the gases of the earth can be extracted and the speed of life in Surrey, which maybe, isn't, maybe we can't properly compare, but maybe we could try. Yeah, I mean, it's... I've found it really overwhelming actually to when I've considered how many different kind of time scales or temporalities are operating at once in this one small space of Surrey or, or bit of Lancashire or wherever. So I think something I was thinking about um, recently we were it was um, Lost Species Day. So I was thinking a little bit about um, oil because what is oil? It's 200, 300 million year old little bits of sea life so oil like and how do you draw that distinction between mm. okay is this geology is this biology and mm. I think actually a little bit maybe in defense of science because I've maybe been a bit too critical and not to sound like a science denier because I think we need all the tools we can get right now I think there are a lot of um particularly like ecological thought that's showing this interconnectedness mm. um and kind of blurring the boundaries um and also over these these time scales can be really useful in helping us to think of other ways of knowing about the world that aren't just based on um, capitalist notions of of value. So yeah, with those insights, you have a different kind of perspective. Of, okay, what is what is oil? So in that sense, it's this almost it sounds almost sacred, doesn't it? This 200, 300 million year old little bit of black gold that you can suddenly you can burn it in an instant and have. Um, transportable transferable energy it's this amazing resource and then 
if you're thinking about it less materially, it's something that can be traded also in less than an instant, actually, on the stock yeah. market. And that is completely a way of, of interacting with a material that's so detached from it. It's just a, a stock and it's just a, a little penny share that isn't really worth worth anything. And then we've got these kind of um, temporal narratives that come from, and I think this is really related to the Anthropocene discourse and the kind of apocalyptic imaginaries and futurisms that that brings with it. This idea of climate emergency that has really gained traction in the last few years and this kind of countdown of however many years now we've got to act upon the, the um, IPCC reports and this kind of real sense of urgency which brings its own its own dangers of <laughs> acting too rapidly without consideration for um, the way that you do that, because you have got to act in a way that um, is responsible and and just. So this kind of the present is kind of caught up in these multiple histories and futures mm -hmm. as well. And even even that clay from Surrey, I've been trying to think about the clay in relation to all of this because it's there at the beginning of human history, isn't it? It's something that you need for um, vessels and sculptures and art, so it's so fundamental to, I mean, you could even say that's the beginning of the Anthropocene, is it? Taking clay mm. and processing it and changing its qualities. And then that's also the reason why Surrey is so leafy and green, because there's clay everywhere and it's really hard to farm, and it's also the reason that they can frack there, because there's this seal on top of the, the shale uh, oil and gas. Mm. So yeah, many <laughs> yeah. temporalities to negotiate there. And I think what's interesting is that exchange of the substances of the earth mm. is very quick and the substances don't even have to be there. So in the city of London, where your commuters from Surrey go and where copper is traded, it do copper doesn't even go to London. And, you know, mm. so it, it's traded as an idea, it's traded as a material value that is fairly insubstantial and it's traded on the basis of a promise into the future. So capitalist time in the Anthropocene is always looking forward because it's traded on what we project the economy to be doing some point later. And so there's future time that's held in the earth, which is really interesting, I think, is the idea that there's a future that's being bought and sold and traded of, of the planet. And yet the contradiction, which is exactly what Lenny was saying, is that is that there's an assumption that these resources are infinite, that they will go on for the future, and the very notion that they might be finite, or that the disruption that that uh, violence of mining or violence of extractivism could cause is avoidable if you simply don't do it. You could simply not do it. That might be one, <laughs> that might be one way of thinking about it, is to consider the Earth as something that is in balance or has life or produces life through a variety of networks, people farming or... People, I don't know, walking under the trees of sorry, I don't know what else are they good for if they can't. But anyway, so, so that idea of time and different forms of time and, different, and the ways in which they clash around ideas of the finite resources is really interesting. And I think, can I just respond to yes, that? Yes, of course. So that it, as well as time, it also kind of connects places as well. So I think something that's been interesting to think about, okay, why does, why does this one site in Surrey matter? It's because of those CO2 particles and the greenhouse gas emissions that, well, they get driven down to the oil refinery near Southampton and then shipped somewhere or burnt there. And we all know how climate change works and the impacts are detached, not only in time, but in, mm. in space. But I think it's cultivating and holding on to the, mm. the reality and, like, and the materiality of those connections, which is something, again, that the planning system just mm. fails to do. There's a court case at the moment um, taking Surrey County Council to court for their decision to allow um, the production license, at, production license at Horse Hill. And one of the key points there is saying whether the council should take into consideration the indirect effects, which is greenhouse gas emissions. And to a lot of us, it seems so obvious that mm. that's what's going to happen. But the planning laws don't necessarily say that that's what you need to consider when you're considering the project, which is in a certain time and a certain place, even though, as we've discussed, it's mm. so much broader than that. Yeah, it's so interesting. Forms of knowledge at play and what you can and can't, what's excluded mm. as an impact of mining. Um, what I wanted to ask, so to ask both Lenny and, and Alice, if there are ways that you might be able to help the audiences for, to, for today's In Conversation from Fabrica, 
kind of imagine a different relationship to the Earth. So I'm thinking that people are mostly, like Lenny, they're on a screen and you're looking at a screen and the screen requires copper. I mean, that's the, the, this, the communications from which we're sitting here require the, the very substances which are being extracted from the Earth, you know, in Latin America at the moment. And also the petrol economy... I mean, maybe people at home, and maybe they haven't driven their cars, but they, they, they you know, they'll be having an online shopping delivery, and um, they, you know, or whatever, you know. So, so we are embedded in the fossil fuel economies, and in the economies of copper. So, both forms of capitalism, both forms which have, if we were going to accept the word Anthropocene, have had have their impacts. So, I wondered if there's something, some way of, and of of helping an audience sat isolated at home in front of a screen, of thinking about a different relationship with the earth. So one of my images is the women at the gate. They, in, in my head, they appear rather like green and common women in white and symbolically asking the world to pause. And I wondered if there was an image from your work in Terra Husta that we could describe and help people think about differently how we position ourselves in relation to the earth. I think that's the question I've been asking uh, myself, so I think this year has been a really interesting year for lots of us because we have been able to be out in, in nature a little bit more and maybe spend more time observing and paying attention. So mm -hmm. when you're talking there about asking what what's in your laptop or whatever it is, I think that's a really interesting question to start with. Like, how would you make this? Or this is kind of where I've been what I've been doing a bit more of is like foraging and not only for food but for materials and what can you make, what can mm -hmm. you do? And I think doing these things that give you a time and a space to just to connect with your little bit of nature, wherever it is. Maybe it's just your garden or maybe you've got some local woods or something. But if there's a little creative practice you could um, cultivate, mm -hmm. I'd say that's a really mm -hmm. uh, fun thing to do, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's um, really nice to, to do that and at the same time maybe learn from people who've done that before, particularly in your own place because there'll be a lot of knowledge about the particular ecology or even geology or, or whatever it is but also um indigenous wisdom is so insightful on that and really actually inspiring because there's a lot about how um really countering that idea of anthropocene and humans being bad for the earth but actually there is another way of having a more um balanced and reciprocal relationship and even gardening for instance that's a relationship with the earth that's not about destruction but you're actually helping you're helping out so there, mm. there's little positive acts but I would also massively warn against um anything that's too individual focused mm. because I think there's a tendency to put a lot of pressure on individuals to take action for the climate and stop this and stop that and mm. um have a lot of personal sacrifices once not holding the people who are accountable Mm. Um, to account so as well as asking what can you make or what's around you um, have a look for your local fossil fuel site or <laughs> whatever it is because I think yeah. there's there's been a lot of protest and action in the last years like focused on um, I don't know urging the government to take action on this that the other going up to London these big spectacular mm. events but there's there's a lot of stuff wherever you look everything is connected so mm. what what is it that you can cultivate a little bit of responsibility mm. towards and where does that take you who are you connected with what um forms of like active solidarity could you yeah. could you find there's not only <laughs> there's fracking all over the world there's mm. different kinds of mining happening um and there's loads of really great grassroots activist groups mm. who would benefit from more support anyways yeah. And Lenny, there's something that you said very early on about periphery, being on the periphery, and I think that the large-scale mining projects of Latin America are at the periphery of our vision. They don't appear to be very central to our economy, but we are absolutely and completely dependent on them through our screen culture. So I don't know if there is something you can tell us through our screen culture that would help people rethink our relationship with those communities in Latin America that you work with that are uh, violently, uh, um, I don't I want to look for the right word, but that, that are subjected to the violence of extractivism and capitalism and of a very uncritical Anthropocene. 
So for me, in my work as an activist and other autonomous groups, I learn uh, more. For example, uh, I learned that the alternatives won't come from just uh, uh, recognized authors that talk about what's happening with us and, and, and so on. Of course, the theory is very important to, to understand better what's happening, but some other issue that is really important that sometimes we, we don't visualize is the struggle. Um, for example, for me, um, talking about uh, talking about with people and the communities and, and the events, um, yeah, you, you see that, for example, um, for many of them, you will see those alternatives and and in the in the practice when people fight when when your life is on risk when you don't have nothing more to lose uh you you can put limits to this type of aggression and domination because maybe the ones who understand very well what's happening but are not in any way connected with those struggles um uh, won't change it because we, yeah, we we have to recognize the ones that could access to different theories and and understand. It. We have some type of privileges compared with people that are just fighting, and but at the same time, that's that's very important. So, oh, just being in their places. Uh, it's it's difficult to embody it, all all those things because we are different, and it it doesn't has to do just with visiting a community where, where by one month and and just that. So we have to be very conscious of our who we are, and and not um, not take for granted many categories or concepts that it's it's part of our discourses of of uh, part of our way of thinking and sometimes we we, we take for granted that they it, it was always like this and and uh, and the alternatives are very li limited and the most the most affected people don't see it that way but we are still being considered as an, as a as a place just to take resources for example and these conceptions of the nature are not uh, separated from from what happened before with politics with this historical um, um, process that we had before so that's why uh, many people think that um, that it was normal yeah we we all the time are the ones so we have to to, to make us qu many questions why why different type of people color people, women, indigenous, impoverished people did ty some type of work. Why Why certain countries ha are, are named thir the third world or the undeveloped world countries uh, and, and not assume that it, it has to do just with knowledge or reinforcing these uh, Eurocentric ideas where that 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 um, the only thing that they that they made uh, thinking that way is that saying that of course the people in those countries don't are not humans. That's why it doesn't matter if they ki if they are killed, if they are working in this way, um, and the only thing that matters is the resources that we can extract from from this these places maybe we could begin to uh, kind of conclude is that idea that that forms of knowledge comes from practice or comes from lived experience and we must be careful when we're thinking about as uh, audiences for art or as academics in the universities or of activists within our own communities about ways of trying to either accept we do not fully understand lived experience or trying to at least accept forms of knowledge which appear to us to be quite different, but trying to see their truth, their claims to truth, as well as our own claims to truth based on understanding. So that's been really, really helpful as a way of kind of concluding. And I'm, I'm going to ask Alice to comment again, but also one of the issues about the work or one of the 
messages of earthworks is around the interpretation of certain kinds of scientific data. And you talked, Alice, just about how you were trying to be sensitive about science, but also questioning its claims to truth, and particularly the ways in which policy uses science to justify forms of extraction. So I'd, I'd like to sort of come, come bring ourselves to a conclusion around these different ways of knowing and thinking about that in relation to perhaps the work that we had uh, that the, is still on display in Fabrica, so Earthworks here. Yeah, big question. I know, I'm sorry. Um, but it's a, it's a concluding yeah, question, so we're coming to an end, question. so it's another big question. Yeah, so I think there's something really interesting about um, yeah, different ways of knowing about the same thing. Um, so I, I think... As this work shows, like it, it comes from the raw geological data, right? And there's so many things that you could do with that. Um, I don't even, I'm not a geologist, so I don't know what those things are. But um, quite often you can do it for a purpose which is based within the capitalist economy. It's going to be for something productive, um, even like at its foundational level. So, like the British Geological Survey, for instance, they're, they're there as like part of. They're, they're there for us, they're like a public body, they're part funded by um, taxpayers and all of that, and yet one of their underlying assumptions is resource exploitation, so then you go back to questioning the the, um, the disciplines in mm. itself. But I don't think that should necessarily take away from undermining the um, validity or the truth in the claims that they can make. I think mm. there's a difference between good science and and bad science and situating mm. science. So I think it's it's not okay to deny science, but it's really healthy to ask, okay, who, mm. what, why did the science come about? Who was doing this research? What were their motivations? Because um, even to take it back to, um, to, to Horse Hill again, there were these instances of um, a small swarm of earthquakes, small earthquakes, um, and that was really controversial. Um, there was... Um, a few scientists who are saying that they were caused by um, a release of pressure from the from the drill site, and then there were others who are saying, no, that can't be the case. We've looked at these tests, and it simply can't be. Um, and in the end, it was those people who are saying it, it wasn't induced seismicity that got the last word. Mm. Um, but there's some, mm. some definite questions over to mm. what the motivations of that were. So I think it's more important to look at the, the politics in which the knowledge has been mm. created than... Mm. Um, just do a flat out yeah. <laughs> denial of, yeah. of science. Yeah, yeah. But, the no, but that knowledge belongs to particular communities and that knowledge is not universal. Knowledge itself is not something that has an automatic or universal claim to truth. So the last question maybe I just would like to summarise around is around the notion of resource. So it's something that Lenny talked about is what's the word and you've just talked about the res geological societies identifying resources. And in my own writing, I actually struggle with the word because I don't know what to use to replace it. So sometimes I use the word substance, substance of the earth. Sometimes I use the word earth material. So I don't really know. But maybe we, if we could, if maybe I could ask you both to just comment really, really quickly is if we're not going to talk about the earth's resources, resources available for extractivism, resources available for capitalism, resources that are mined, what should the word be? For me, maybe not being very precise with, with uh, the authors and the people who, who really investigate uh, um, those categories, but from the pr discussions that we have, I, I think um, resource comes from the idea of uh, that um, has to do with this, uh, with the, from from the modern times, with with, with the human being, uh, it's something different from the nature, and nature is an object, an object, and and human being can can do whatever with that object, or uh, including uh, including. Um, Dominarlo with science. It's what I think the pur the purpose of, of many uh, of science is to dominate nature. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's in that context where this term concept 
came. And yeah, in Latin America, many people use it, and in, 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 um, it's, it's very common. But if we don't our critique uh, from what we are saying, referring to the nature as a resource, we can be reinforcing um, uh, the, the process of the capitalism because I think for them it's, it's a resource and uh, it doesn't matter how, how much you exploit it, although at the end the, the, the process of production it would be collapsed and, and capitalism will finish but also will, will disappear, it doesn't matter. So um, for me, it's very important. And, and yeah, it's some of the things that differ so much with the conception of, of, of nature from, from indigenous, for some communi indigenous communities is that, yeah, the, the resource is not something uh, external from the human being. It's, it's something which is where all of us are part of that. It's everything. And we are just one. Th of course, the human being have differences with the other um, beings, but we are part of the same thing. Um, so I think it's it's very important to to go more in deep on that. And I think mm, the tendencies of conservation and many others that try to look alternatives use this term, and we should change that. You were breaking up towards the end, Lenny, but I think I got most of your point, which is around resource as seeing as uh, understanding nature as an object and separate. So I don't know, Alice, if you can help us with thinking about alternatives, maybe not just to the word, but to do is to thinking as nature as separate or objectified from us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I was, I was thinking of the context in which you might do this and a lot of what's played out at Horse Hill and such is in the context of a, a courtroom or a planning office. And of course, then you can't be talking about the Earth's gifts or whatever. <laughs> Some things just wouldn't go down. But I think something that can be effective is to speak about what else it is other than a, other than a resource and mm. to, to lay claim to that in a way that mm. makes sense. So mm. by extracting that resource, what is being put at? stake mm. so if it's our shared environment or mm. our place where we enjoy going for cycle rides mm. or our clean air or whatever mm. it is i think can be a, a powerful and yeah. practical way of reframing the whole yeah. um, debate but if i return us to the beginning just in conclusion if i can kind of sum up is where we started was trying to think about critical approaches to the anthropocene that think outside those categories and the very notion that you, in a courtroom, you can't, you have to use the word resource, or in a struggle, you have to use the word resource. Some of those things bind us to the very categories that we're trying to escape and rethink. And so those are the kind of challenges about feminist or decolonial perspectives, is the extent to which we're tied to and bound to the language of the dominant, so the master's tools that created the master's house, how much we're bound to that and how much it's possible for us to escape those and begin a process of not just rethinking, but actually living, living differently alongside the earth and alongside each other. Thanks, thank you both. There were very, very interesting, very challenging ways of thinking, looking and living in an extractivist Anthropocene. Thank you very much.